Ladies and gentlemen, over the past 24 or so hours, AMD have been busy little beavers. Raja Kodori has taken to Twitter and unleashed a storm of tweets, giving us insights into RX Vega, specifically on performance, pricing, and, well, just a lot of stuff. We'll go into that soon. But we'll launch the video with Threadripper, because the 8-core derivative known as the 1900X, has launched, which of course features, amongst other things, 64 PCIe lanes. And then we're going to very quickly touch upon the Ryzen Pro desktop processor releases, along with AMD finally enabling NVMe RAID on X399 motherboards. But, as I said, we're going to be starting things out with the 1900X. This grabs headlines because it is, of course, the cheapest processor for X399 motherboards. I grant you that doesn't really mean much because X399 motherboards are not exactly cheap themselves, so hopefully prices of these uh, motherboards will start to plummet a little bit. So what do you get with this? Well, essentially it's a slightly faster version of an 1800X. For example, in benchmarks one can see that the 1900X does slightly beat the 1800X in most uh, benchmarks by, you know, 5 to 10 frames per second, depending obviously on the game. And if we were to take look at the productivity benchmarks, well, obviously it is faster than the 1700 by quite a bit, but the 1900X is maintaining about a 10% lead over the 1800X, and there's a couple of reasons for this. The first, and perhaps most obvious, is it does have a 200 megahertz advantage when it comes to the base clock. But perhaps most telling of all is it has support for quad channel memory. I'm going to be very curious to see what happens if you were to run an a, a 1800X and a 1900X with the same memory configuration. In other words, just dual channel, same clock speeds, everything else identical. See what type of difference there would be in terms of performance. So why does this exist? Well, there are a couple of benefits. The primary one is I.O. So if you need those additional PCIe lanes or you want quad channel memory support, which obviously, yes, you get the performance, but B, you also get the ability to shove more memory into your system. Although, let's face it, I don't really know why you'd need that amount of memory, but only a few uh, processors, but I guess it's possible. The problem with this in my opinion anyway, is that the 1700, 1700X and 1800X typically, and obviously typically is a strong word, typically overclock to roughly about the same clock speeds. Obviously silicon lottery does play into it as along with the motherboard and the cooler, but generally within about 1 to 200 megahertz they're going to sit within one another. So that means that you can generally get the 1700 uh, for most retailers at around the low 300 mark. In fact, Amazon currently have it for 300 US dollars. The 1800X is around 430 to 300 to 450 US dollars at the moment. Now, I've said all along, I originally bought the 1700X processor, although I have reviewed with a 1700 and I've also reviewed, um, sorry, I've also tested an 1800X, not for the channel, just, you know, for a friend. And I've also reviewed the 1600X and generally, as I said, just messing around with overclocking, they do get to about the same clock speed. So in my opinion, anyway, the best value CPU is the 1700 when it comes to the mainstream lineup. So I'm not 100% convinced of the value proposition here of the 1900. Yes, it does serve as a kind of diving in point for uh, Threadripper, and I guess technically if you want to upgrade in the future, then that's a great thing, but it just seems kind of expensive for what you're getting. I'm not saying it's a bad processor, certainly some people will have certain usages for it, but to me, it's a bit like the lower end skews for even Skylake X. And yes, of course, with Skylake X, it's actually kind of worse because you get even fewer PCIe lanes, but you kind of get my drift. One possibility, and once again, we're going to have to wait and see what happens, is because this does have a higher TDP, uh, 180 watts, it's possible that overclocking might be slightly better with the 1900X. Whether that's enough for you to cough up at least 100 US dollars more on the CPU itself, along with the motherboard as well, which, let's face it, you can get a pretty decent B350 motherboard for not too much now. 
well, that's down to you, of course. Next up, um, well, I was going to do this in a slightly different order, but it makes sense, I guess, just to get the Threadripper stuff out of the way uh, right now. AMD are enabling NVMe RAID on X399 platforms, which is a very good thing. This is going to be an update in both the driver software and also a BIOS update. So this allows the motherboard, the X399 motherboard, just to clarify, to boot from RAID 0, RAID 1, and RAID 10. So in short, you can have a boot of up to 10 NVMe drives. Of course, how many people actually really need that is down to your imagination. And just for separation's sake, it's imperative to know that this is not going to be the case for the X370 and B350. So in other words, it is quite simply a, a bonus feature, if you will, for the X399. It does, however, serve as a slap in the face for Intel, who don't forget, you actually need a dongle to get certain higher levels of NVMe bootable raids working. So obviously, uh, the purpose of this isn't necessarily because it's going to appeal to a large portion of their customers. Instead, it's more to say, hey, we've got this feature. We're not charging for it. Intel are na 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 na. Yes, yeah, so just like that as well. That's exactly what Lisa Sue said when she was uh, formulating this plan. Very quick piece of news because it's another launch, and that is the AMD Ryzen Pro desktop processors. Essentially, these are almost identical to the other Ryzen's, but with a couple of subtle differences. Essentially, these are developed purely for enterprise and public sectors. So they have a couple of additional features. One is Guard Me, or Guard MI, technology, which enables state-of-the-art power-on, power-off silicon security, and also commercial-grade reliability. In other words, in theory, at least, you're not going to have to worry about reliability of these chips, you know, they're binned with better quality uh, silicon, and as I mentioned, because of the guard encryption, you've, sorry, you've all, because of the guard technology, you've also got built-in AES 128-bit encryption, Windows 10 enterprise security support, and also supports uh, FTPM and TPM2 features as well. So, in other words, if security is a thing for you then this is the process to go with however for the general user for gamers and content creators that type of thing you're probably not necessarily going to want to opt for these particular processes finally we're going to end with a flurry of tweets from raja kodori who of course is instrumental in the running of the radion technologies group so it is important to first distinguish that Radeon Technologies Group had already started uh, development of Vega way before um, Raja actually took the helm. But he has been on a trip to India for the past couple of weeks. One for holiday reasons, the second one to oversee uh, some engineering sites, uh, including one in Bangalore. So he has now um, risen from the Twitter dead, so to speak, to as I said, answer and respond to quite a lot of concerns because obviously he hasn't really been so much around recently. Now, there is a lot to talk about and quite frankly, I'm going to wait a day or two because I have a feeling more information is going to probably pop up on this and probably is going to go slightly further in depth into explanations. I think he's probably going to do a Reddit AMA if I'm totally honest. But um, until then, I'm just going to very briefly go over some of his tweets and you can check them out yourself and maybe we can get the discussion going. So this one I found particularly interesting. Infinity Fabric on Vega is optimized for the server. It's very, it's very scalable fabric and you will see customer optimized versions of it in the future. Before we go into you know analysis, I'll continue. Uh, to really understand the architecture, you need to understand the architecture in the content of the overall roadmaps, trade-offs, and constraints. And folks doing performance slash per square millimeter comparisons need to account for Vega 10 features, competing with three competitive socks. This includes GP100, 102, and 104. Rationalizing Vega architecture based on RX implementations is an incomplete analysis. Sales data tends to favor performance per dollar, but some opinions favor performance per watt. We try to give users the options based upon their preference. Just for clarification's sake, that's that mode that allows you to go for balance, turbo, and whatever. In fact, he actually says new articles in the last few days. Vega has the largest performance per watt dynamic range than any other GPU that I recall. 
Uh, and he says it's hard to filter out the biases of miners and gamers as more often than not we don't know who is who on social media. We live in interesting times where the gamer doesn't want miners to buy the G cards and miners don't want gamers to buy the GPUs. The noise around the pricing doesn't help us at all. Not sure where it's coming from, it only benefits competition. Every Vega we sell effectively adds a new user to our small but base of enthusiast gamers and it's our best interest to enable a lot of them. I don't have much more to add on Vega other than reinforcing our supply teams are working hard to increase availability. Um, I tried to stay away from social media while travelling to be present where I am sometimes successfully and good to be home and blah blah blah. Another interesting thing that Kodori has said is he addressed essentially the rumour that AMD are losing $100 on every graphics card sold. Now this rumour started with Fudzilla who then continued this rumour and said that they've got industry sources who tell them yes and we've seen of course a myriad of different invoices and people have spoken up about this including Overclockers UK and God knows whomever else. You probably know the story so I'm not going to uh, spend too long covering that part but what is new is that he says that well the actual bill of materials for Vega are not what reports think they are. Essentially he's hinting that maybe AMD are not losing money or they're not losing as much as what's hinted. To be honest, this is kind of confusing. And, I mean, we could do a lot of analysis purely on the fact that uh, the Infinity Fabric is optimised for servers. And he basically, uh, in further tweets, explains that the Infinity Fabric and many of the new features, some of which still need software enablement, explain most of the delta. So what he's basically saying is that so far some of the software is still not enabled. Infinity Fabric is kind of working how we expect, at least how I'm interpreting this, and of course it's Twitter so character limitation is a bit of a problem, but when he talks about square millimeter, you know it's very easy to say well this GPU of this size uh, is being outperformed by this GPU which is smaller, or this GPU uh, they're both the same size, but hey, this one's doing X. Well, the problem with that, and I'm basically paraphrasing him here, is that Vega essentially is being designed to compete with three different uh, GPUs from NVIDIA. So you've got the compute-based one, which is the GP100, and then, of course, a couple of customers-facing ones, which are the GP102 and G GP104. And that's one of the reasons that so much of this die space is just being eaten alive. Anyways, as I said, there was a lot more analysis that I could do on this, but quite frankly, I'm going to hold off for a day or two because I have a feeling a lot more information on this topic is going to emerge over the next 24 to 48 hours. So I'd prefer to put a lot further details on further clarification on some of his statement because I feel that's probably best and I don't want to just do wild speculation because, as I said, some of his statements are still somewhat ambiguous and I'd really like to know what he means by software enablement, essentially, especially on the... Uh, consumer facing side in other words for gamers and just generally I feel that uh, we might be getting some more answers regardless and my statement by the way for those who aren't regular watchers of this channel and by means click on the subscribe button hint hint that I still feel that RX Vega 56 is probably an excellent buy for almost anyone unless you're really invested in Nvidia's architecture because I feel that it's going to get better in the next several weeks with driver updates, just how any graphics architecture does. It does outperform the GTX 1070 in most games at the moment, not all. NVIDIA are certainly battering them in some, and I feel that if you can buy it at the appropriate price, it's probably the best card on the market for that type of price point. But with that said, it does still have some issues, and if heat is a concern, power requirements are a concern, or once again you've got G-Sync or whatever, then obviously it's not really the best graphics card for you. With that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.